Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CSE January Lecture. We are at the Center for Climate Science and Engineering at the University of Toronto. I'm Daniela Boden, uh, the CSE Manager, and we are pleased to feature Dr. Adam Sobo today in our first guest lecture of the year. So before we get started, I would like to go through the land acknowledgement. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Toronto Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So who are we? As I said before, we are the Center for Climate Science and Engineering. We are a research and education center within the Civil and Mineral Engineering Department at the University of Toronto, established in 2019. So the CSE is made up of seven faculty members who conform the executive team and who participate together in a multidisciplinary research at the intersection of the engineering and climate science. So there is Oya Merkan, the center director who focuses on structural analysis. Marianne Hatabolo focuses on transportation. Paul Kushner looks at climate dynamics. Graham Norville looks at health and safety processes in energy and chemical engineering. Daniel Posen on life cycle assessment. Karen Smith on atmospheric science. Marianne Tucci on building science. And then me, the CSE manager. So the team works together to do education, education about climate science, engineering. Two graduate courses have been developed on top of some online learning models that currently is under development. The team also works to do research. So the faculty members are carrying out collaborative research projects. And finally, the team works to do outreach events, just like this one, we, where we invite the public or other university people to come and give a presentation about topics that we feel are aligned with the mandate and the vision of the center. So as part of these outreach events, our next guest lecturer is Dr. Karen Chappell from the University of Toronto. She's a professor in the Department of Geography and Planning and the director of the School of Cities. She will be speaking in February about the unintended consequences of climate change mitigation. So we will send you a notice when the event is coming along. But now we are going to get into today's presentation. So I would like to introduce Adam Sobel from Columbia University. He is a professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and Engineering School. He studies the dynamics of climate and weather, particularly in the tropics. Recently, he has focused on understanding the risk to society from extreme weather events and climate change. Currently, he hosts a podcast named Deep Convention, featuring conversation with other climate scientists. So now I will pass it over to you, Dr. Sobel. Uh, thank you, Daniela, and thank you um, all, the center uh, faculty and team for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen. It will stop other screen sharing. Do you want to continue? Yes, I think so. And then we'll do yes. that. And then we will, what happened to the PowerPoint? Oh, okay. Now we're going to go to full screen. This is always the test. So that you see that on the full screen? Yes, we can okay, see very it. Very good. So yeah, there's the title. Um, it's my pleasure to speak to you today. Here's an outline. It has two bullet points. I'm going to give a, a short um, overview of climate change and extreme weather, some things we know and some things we don't know, and trying to give some sense of why. So some sense of, of, of there's some general reasons that make some kinds of events understood better than other kinds of events. And um, I'll try to give some sense of that. And I think that that helps when you, you see stories in the news um, to understand the, the context. And then because I think it's always good to ground things in, in reality. And I know that the inter uh, interests of this group are very broad and it's interdisciplinary. I'm gonna talk about a particular event that happened this last year, um, the end of August, beginning of September, the remnants of Hurricane Ida hit New York City and caused a surprising amount of um, death and destruction 
And I'm going to talk about why that was and some of the issues that it raises. And I think some of them are specific to that event, but others are general and, um, and apply to many other events. So to, just to put us all on the same page, it's probably not, um, you know, not new information to anybody here that the climate is getting warmer. Here's one of several pictures I'm going to show from the most recent IPCC report. So this is the two plots of the Earth's global mean surface temperature from 1850 to present. And over the last, oh, I don't know, century or so, it's been going up. Um, and especially since the late 20th century, and here's a statement from the IPCC that each of the last four decades has been warmer than any that preceded it since 1850. So it's a pretty clear signal. And we know that it's due to human emissions of greenhouse gases. So here's um, history and then projections to the future from the world's climate modeling uh, centers. So the, the, you know, the, the history is in the left and at the right is the future. Um, and these different curves are the different emission scenarios. Probably most of the audience are familiar with these, but sort of increasing uh, order of how, how much we emit greenhouse gases. Um, and so depending on what humans choose to do, you get more warming or less, but even the most conservative warming, even the most uh, uh, ambitious, I should say, the most aggressive emissions cuts keep us roughly at the same level uh, you have us having a little more warming than we've already had and then staying there. And the worst scenarios have us getting quite a bit warmer. And the ranges, there's a range around every line. Each line is an average over many different uh, climate models from different groups around the world. And the range is shown in the shading. So there's some uncertainty due to which model you take, but the bigger uncertainty, if you go out into the, you know, go out to 2100, the bigger uncertainty is what people do. So we know that. Um, and there are some things we understand, some consequences of warming are pretty certain and others aren't. So here's one that we're pretty certain of. That's that the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is going up. And this is controlled by the so-called clausius clapeyron relation, which is basic physics. So the warmer the air gets, the more water can be in the vapor phase. And even though usually we're subsaturated and we don't have as exactly as much as the maximum possible, nonetheless, the amount that's actually in the at atmosphere seems to track that maximum pretty closely for reasons that we understand pretty well, although I won't talk in detail about them. And so these are trends from observations historically. Um, and on the lower right is trends in the surface humidity. So this is like the slope of the trend, just mapped as a map. And the greenish colors mean it's increasing, which it is almost everywhere. So it's getting more humid in absolute terms. The relative humidity stays approximately constant, but the absolute humidity goes up because the saturation value goes up with temperature. And on the left is the total column. So the integral of the amount of water vapor in the vertical throughout the whole atmosphere, in this case, integrated over the globe. And that's also been going up. Um, this is observed um, pretty well by in the satellite era by satellites. Um, so that's been going up. So, so we know the water vapor is going up. We know why it's going up. And that's an example of something we know. And so some things about extreme events are consequences of that. And that means that those are consequences that we understand. Um, another pretty certain consequence is sea level rise um, because warm water takes up more volume than cold water. Um, you get some amount of sea level rise just from the warming itself. And then you get some more due to ice melting, um, land ice melting. Sea ice melting doesn't do anything because it was already floating. So this is observations of sea level rise um, in meters uh, over the 20th and early 21st century. And there's some uncertainty at the beginning. Those different curves are different observational estimates from tide gauges and stuff. But the later record includes satellite, which is remarkably accurate. Um, and you can see how fast sea level is rising. We'll show some plots later of projections, what will happen in the future. The magnitude is uncertain. Uh, the magnitude of sea level rise is uncertain in the future, but the sign of it is certain. We know sea level is going up. It's not going down, um, uh, no matter what happens. Um, then on the other hand, there's things we really don't know. So this is a map of changes in precipitation for one particular emission scenario, but it's one of the more, um, more dramatic ones, you know, one of the strong, worst ones where we emit more greenhouse gases rather than less. And um, so this is the change in precipitation average over all the models in the late 21st century compared to the late 20th century. And so the greenish colors means more rain and the, and the orange or red colors mean uh, less rain. And you see a pattern, you know, and we could talk about why that pattern is what it is. You have more rain at high latitudes and a kind of complicated pattern at low latitudes. But the hatching, the diagonal lines, um, mean that there's either no change or, the, or there's no robust change, meaning that the models disagree and, and the model, or they don't agree enough. And if the, 
and that's what's happening over most of the planet, especially the places where it rains the most. And even in some places where the models agree, like over the equatorial Pacific, I think we could make arguments that actually they could still be wrong. So this is something that's rather uncertain. And to some extent, this is uh, the change in precipitation is related to changes in atmospheric circulation, in which way the winds go and, and um, both horizontally and vertically. And that um, is one of the more uncertain features of climate change. So anything about extreme events that's a consequence of this um, is gonna be more uncertain. And we'll come, come back to that. Uh, so as I've been saying, extreme weather is influenced by everything about climate change, depends what kind of event we're talking about, but they're influenced by the things we know like humidity and sea level rise and the temperature increase itself and the most uncertain aspects like atmospheric circulation. So when we talk about extreme events, um, and I'm gonna give you, you know, a subset of them, how they're changing and, and why, um, that depends on what kind of event we're talking about and how it's related to these different factors. So the simplest one is heat waves. So this is a map of uh, temperature extremes from the heat wave that hit the Pacific Northwest, including the Northwest United States and um, Western, uh, Southwestern uh, Canada, and um, in June, 2021. So this was a really, really extreme event especially in Portland, Oregon, which is a city I know really well because my wife's from there and I spent a lot of my life there. Um, and the temperatures were really very, very extreme. This is not a, super, a region with a very hot climate, but temperatures in Portland uh, reached uh, about 120 Fahrenheit, which is like about 50, almost 50 Celsius. Really, really crazy temperatures and stayed up around there for a few days. Um, I'm sure you saw, all saw this in the news. And this is one particular instance of something that's happening more and more, which is that we're seeing more and more heat waves with serious health and other consequences. And the reason for this is really simple. It's getting warmer. The first thing we know, I mean, I didn't, you know, the first thing we know about global warming, what does carbon dioxide do? It raises the temperature. And a heat wave, of course, isn't the average temperature. It's, a, it's when you, what you get due to some particular weather event, usually a high pressure system that comes through. But the simplest assumption about how the climate works is that the weather in some sense stays the same. Now that's not really true, but, but how it changes in detail is complicated and uncertain. But if you just assume that, th that the fluctuations of the coming and goes of the high pressure systems are basically the same, but that the whole baseline temperature is higher, then if you define a heat wave as you're warmer than some threshold for some amount of time, you'd expect that heat waves would happen more often and be more extreme. And to a first approximation, that's basically what happens. It's not quite as simple as that, but that's about what happens. So heat waves are pretty easy to understand. They should be getting worse according to everything we understand. And they are, the observations show that. I'm not gonna show you statistics, but you can find them. Um, and uh, so that's something we know pretty well. Um, cold snaps are becoming less likely. There's still some debate about this, but I think it's pretty clear that overall, this is a, this is a graph showing the average temperature of the coldest days in autumn, that's what this particular paper that's cited below focused on, in the northern hemisphere over a range of latitudes. Latitude is on the left and the year is on the right, and you can see more and more red colors, and that means the coldest days aren't as cold as they used to be. And while there's arguments about this because cold snaps are also affected by atmospheric circulation, and there's arguments that circulation is changing in such a way that you know some extreme cold events might be happening more often. I think overall the statistics show that's not, that's not true. So that's one kind of extreme event we have to worry about a little bit less, um, which is either good or bad depending on your perspective. But at any rate, it's pretty clear um, that that's also a simple consequence of the temperature increase. Um, droughts is a little more complicated and has multiple dimensions to it. This is a map I pulled off just to be timely. I pulled this map off today. This is the map of the United States. Sorry for being a little um, United States centric here, uh, but that's from where I speak to you. So this is a map of the so-called drought monitor in the United States. And you can see what the map means, uh, at least qualitatively on the right. And you can see that most of the Western United States is in some degree of drought. So why is this? Is it a consequence of global warming? Well, sort of a little bit and to some extent, you know, some extent, yes, to some extent, no. Um, and to some extent we don't know. So here's one particular paper that's getting a little bit old now, but I think it's still um, uh, not wrong. Um, and it's, uh, based, it's based on some older climate models, but I don't think it's changed dramatically by some of my colleagues here at Columbia, not me. Um, and it's showing um, versus time into the future from the historical past into the, into the future, um, 
the, the water balance at the surface, so precipitation minus surface evaporation for the Southwest United States, um, which is a, already an arid region prone to drought. And it's showing how this region is getting drier and drier, which we've already seen happening. And some of this is due to circulation changes. So some of this is due to actually raining less in the models. And that is a consequence of atmospheric circulation. And that in general is uncertain, although this is one of the regions where the models agree the most, and it seems most likely that they, they may be right. But in, in general, you know, there's other places where the models disagree and we don't really know. What we do know is that when it's hotter, the water that's in the soil evaporates more quickly. That's also part of this because it's precipitation minus this evaporation. And that's a direct consequence of the temperature. And that once you have whatever water you have that falls from the sky, if it's gone more quickly from the surface, that means you have less water in um, rivers and streams and reservoirs and so on. So that um, hydrologic drought, as we say, is, it is um, partly a consequence of meteorological drought, which is due to rain, which is uncertain, but also a consequence of temperature, which is certain, at least in sign. When I say certain, I mean that we know the direction things are going, not always the magnitude. Um, hot and dry uh, gives you more fires. So fire is complicated. Um, it's, you know, it's affected by how you manage the forest. It's affected by people starting fires, it's affected by, you know, a, a lot of things. But all else equal, if it's hotter, um, then not only does the water evaporate more quickly from the soil, but also from dead trees and other, you know, um, burnable stuff on the ground. So you expect more fires all else equal in a hotter climate. And indeed that's what happens. And this is a paper by my former colleague, Park Williams. He's moved from Columbia to um, UCLA recently, but this is a paper he wrote showing dramatic increases um, in California wildfire over the last um, 50 years or so. And, and the, the claim is that at least some of this is climate related. And I think that's pretty clear. Um, hurricanes. Hurricanes is a topic um, very near and dear to my heart. I probably spent more time in hurricanes than on the rest of the types of extremes that I just um, have been talking to you about. Uh, but I don't want to spend too much time on it, um, but I'll give you a summary. Hurricanes is a complicated one. Um, so here are some of the effects of climate change on hurricanes. And at the bottom is a graphic from not the most recent IPCC report from the one before, most recent one didn't have a graphic quite like this. The um, basic sense of the conclusions though hasn't changed. And just to quickly explain what this graph, these graphics shows, this is for two particular basins, the Western North Pacific um, and the North Atlantic, which is most relevant to the United States and, and Canada to some extent. Um, and the, the, on the, uh, the horizontal, there's four different metrics of tropical cyclones and in each case, What's shown is some sense of the projected change into the future. So one is tropical cyclone frequency, how many storms are there? The other is how many that reach category four and five, the most intense ones rated by their winds. Three is an overall measure of the change in lifetime maximum intensity. So how strong are, are the storms getting that, that happen? And the last is precipitation. And so, and, and the vertical is, is giving you the projected sign uh, and magnitude of the change and percent of the historical mean with the blue, dark blue bar giving the average change and the light blue shading giving you the range. And this is all expert judgment based on a wide range of evidence. It's not directly from climate models alone because climate models aren't that good at simulating hurricanes and certainly weren't at the time of this report. So um, I think rather than interpret those graphs sort of point by point, I'll just summarize through the bullets above. Um, so, and this is, I'm, I'm going to talk here about both um, the historical trends that we've observed, as well as the, the projections based on what we understand, a lot of which comes from numerical models and theoretical understanding. And sometimes we have, in the best case, all those sources of evidence would agree. In other words, theory and models would predict something and we'd actually see it happening. But sometimes theory and models predict something we haven't seen it yet. Uh, and sometimes we see something happening, we don't know why. But um, one thing we're pretty certain about is that the storms are getting stronger, that the intensities are getting stronger. And when we say intensity, we mean the strength of the strongest winds within the storm. And that's what determines the, the category under the Saffir Simpson scale that we typically use. Um, and the reason we believe this happening, um, first of all, the best models we have predict it as a consequence of warming. Um, we have a good theoretical understanding of why hurricanes get as strong as they do on average. Um, it's something called potential intensity theory that tells us 
how strong a hurricane can get based on climate and um, what our climate models predict is that potential intensity goes up and actual intensity usually tracks that on average over many storms. And so we, uh, so that's what we expect. And our best attempts to um, look at what's been happening in the observations also indicate that intensity has been going up. There's some debate over that, but I think the evidence is pretty compelling. And um, so, so that's something we're pretty sure about. The amount of rain produced by hurricanes is almost certainly increasing. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit. So I think I won't say more about that at this slide, but it's a consequence of the amount of water vapor we have in the atmosphere, which we're pretty certain about. Um, the observations are actually a little tricky. It's hard to observe rainfall in hurricanes in a statistically you know, significant way, but, um, but uh, the evidence, the observational evidence is certainly not inconsistent with it. And the theoretical and model evidence is very strong. Um, the frequency of storms, so how many hurricanes are there each year, is not well understood at all. Over the whole Earth, it hasn't yet changed very much. It fluctuates around year to year, not that much, but hasn't. there's no clear trend. Some basins, like the Atlantic, show strong increases. Others show decreases. To some extent, we understand those as consequences of regional climate change. Sometimes we don't. What we, you know, so, so the number of the frequency of storms is, is really, really uncertain. Um, let's just leave it there. Um, and there's other things like changes in storm tracks uh, like the, uh, that have been observed. For example, the maximum intensities seem to be being reached at higher latitudes, which is certainly a concern for like the Northeast US and Canada. Um, we don't completely understand that though. And it's um, the models sort of do it, but I think we're still debating that one. And there's evidence of things like the storms moving slower, like moving the, the actual storm center moving along its track slower, but I think even the observational evidence for that is still debated and it's not something that we understand yet as a climate signal. So complicated picture with different sort of lines of evidence telling us different things and which are sometimes consistent and sometimes not. Um, so, but one thing we do know if we're interested in hazard and risk and actual disasters, you know, um, that matter to people is that a lot of the worst disasters from hurricanes are coastal flood events. And here's a picture of um, the New Jersey shore being totally submerged in Hurricane Sandy, which happened in 2012. That was a coastal flooding event, meaning coastal flood means the winds from the hurricane blow the ocean water onto the land in the storm surge. And, and um, because we know that the sea level's rising, then even if nothing, even if the storms don't change at all, um, we expect worse coastal flooding events because these, the water's just starting from a higher level and so I showed you the, the observations of sea level rise um, in the past. This is now the latest IPCC projections of sea level rise into the future. Um, and of course, it depends on the model. There's these ranges in the shading. It certainly depends on how much you know, uh, greenhouse gases we emit. But you see rises that could easily get as high as a meter um, uh, by the end of the century or, or by 2150, which is the end shown here. And to... Um, give you some sense of perspective. The storm surge in Sandy, um, in other words, the amount that the water was raised just by the storm itself, um, leaving the tides and the mean sea level out of it, was about um, two and a half meters. So if, if and a, a two and a half meter storm surge is like much, much more rare than a one and a half meter storm surge. So if you raise the storm surge, the, the sea level everywhere by one meter, and you don't do anything else, you don't have any more sea walls or you know anything else, then every one and a half meter storm becomes as bad as a two and a half meter storm surge storm would have been you know, before. And so it's a much, much, much um, worse hazard. And this is a really, really big deal for a lot of coastal areas um, in, the, in the lower latitudes and even not so low latitudes um, like New York City uh, around the world. Uh, so what about rainfall-driven floods, so floods that are not coastal, but that come from rain? So to do this topic, this is my transition to one, I'm going to talk about this in the context of one particular event. So I want to talk about Hurricane Ida in the Northeast, and I'm going to talk here not just about climate science, but about some other issues, including weather forecast and um, uh, forecast communication and warning issues, as well as climate adaptation issues a little bit. Um, but but use this as a context to, to put the climate science of these kind of events into context. So first of all, just the basic facts of it. So Hurricane Ida was a pretty powerful hurricane, um, hit the Louisiana coastline on August 29th, the, the anniversary of Katrina, um, uh, which had happened in 2000, 
five, so 16 years earlier, pretty spooky, um, spooky coincidence. Uh, did quite a bit of damage in Louisiana, although uh, including New Orleans, although hit a bit to the west and wasn't as bad for New Orleans as it could have been, but still pretty bad. And then as it hurricanes typically do after landfall, it became uh, rapidly weaker. Um, you can see the letters, you know, when it gets to be a D, that means tropical depression, which is a much weaker storm. So the winds are quite, you know, uh, much less than they were at landfall. And then it becomes, um, and, and then it tracks over land. This is this was the forecast, by the way, issued on um, Sunday evening when it made landfall, and it shows it being predicted to hit the New York City area as a depression, a much weaker storm, um, on Thursday. Uh, and note how the track, the center of the track, goes right over New York City. If you know where New York City is, the, the black line goes right over it. Um, but you know, this happens pretty regularly that we get remnants of tropical storms, and usually we get a bunch of rain, and it's not that bad. But this one turned out to be really bad. Um, the cyclone interacted with a mid-latitude front in such a way as to produce a huge amount of rain, and it killed about 50 people in the New York City metro area, so meaning New York, New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, which is actually a higher death toll than Sandy had um, for the same area. So, uh, so we really, uh, I, I, I and I think most others who were watching this knew it was going to be a lot of rain, but really weren't quite expecting the degree of disaster that it caused. So I want to talk about what happened there for a few minutes. Um, so first of all, here's how much rain it produced. These are, these are station observations. So you can see the scale maybe on the left. Sorry, it's in inches, but I believe that in Canada, people know how to read inches. Um, and um, so the reds are like over six inches, which is a lot of rain for our area. These are, these are observations of day, the total amount that fell in a day, a 24 hour period on September 2nd, which was when most of the rain uh, fell. And uh, oh, and by the way, I, just to give a sense of the timing, so the 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 storm hit ended up hitting New York City a little bit earlier than this forecast said. So it was just to keep a sense of the dates, because I'm going to show you a few more things that have dates. Wednesday night, September first, into Thursday, um, September second. So this is that 24 hour period rainfall totals, and you see numbers of six, eight uh, inches, which is a lot for us, um, or maybe for anyone, but you know certainly for, for, for our area. This is a lot of rain in it and directly over New York City and surrounding area, very, very heavily populated area. Um, but the real reason it's so bad, it was so bad, wasn't the total daily rain, although that was a lot, it was the hourly number. So this map shows um, uh, the map, uh, the maximum value that fell in a single hour during that period, whatever that hour happened to be in inches again. So we had numbers of three and up to four inches at some stations, including 3.8, I believe, in Central Park, the gauge quite near to where I'm sitting now talking to you. And this is in one hour. And this is really bad. And how do we know this is what made the difference? Because we had a really clear comparison. So we had another event just about a little week and a half earlier, the, the um, Hurricane Henri, um, had passed to the east of us over um, just past the eastern tip of Long Island into and tracked into southern New England. And although the center was far from it, we caught a rain band that gave us at these same gauges, like I can tell you at, at Central Park, the gauge in Central Park showed two inches in an hour for two hours in a row. So we had from Henri, we had four inches in two hours. And it wasn't that bad. It caused some flooding. A few subway lines got flooded for a little while. As far as I, I don't know if there were zero deaths, but I'm not aware of it. It was a, at least a low number and maybe no deaths. It was, it, was a, it was a flooding event, but it wasn't anywhere near as bad as this, which was three, three and a half, four inches in, in one hour. So it, this, because this one shut down the whole subway system for an extended period of time, as I said, killed a lot of people, especially in cars and basement apartments that flooded. And so we had a really clear control experiment to show how an hourly rainfall causes, if it's hot, gets over a certain threshold, you get much worse consequences than if it's just below that threshold. Two inches in an hour, not so bad. Even two hours like that in a row, three, three and a half, four inches in an hour, really catastrophic, okay? Um, so what's the connection to climate change? Um, 
I'll get to the forecast in a minute, but first the connection to climate change. Uh, I asked before, what do we expect for precipitation extremes? On the left is a, is a modeling and theoretical study by Paulo Gorman and Tapio Schneider from about a decade ago now. And what's shown is um, on the left picture shows the expected change in the magnitude of pre daily precipitation extremes as a percent of the historical average um, at given latitude bands. And there's a bunch of different curves. The shaded region shows what you get from some climate models. Then there's some different theoretical curves and they came up with one that agrees. The, um, the, the, the uh, dotted one is what you get if you just assume that everything tracks with the so-called Clausius-Clapeyron relation, which is shown on the right. So the Clausius-Clapeyron relation tells you how much water vapor you can have um, at a given temperature before it reaches saturation and condenses. So that's absolutely basic physics. And if you assume that's all that matters and that precipitate, and, and by the way, the, the global amount of precipitate, the total amount of precipitation on the earth is not controlled by this. For interesting reasons, it's controlled by the earth's radiation balance. But precipitation extremes, which are really good at just squeezing out the water that's there in the atmosphere, are actually in some ways simpler than the average precipitation. So you might expect them, the, the default naive expectation is that they will scale with the amount of the saturation value. And that gives you the dotted curve. And it's something around 7% per degree warming um, is what you'd expect. Actually, the models predict a little less than that. It depends on the latitude. Um, it's a little more uncertain in the tropics. But roughly speaking, we expect precipitation extremes to get more extreme with a lot of confidence because it's related to that water vapor increase that's a, that's, that we understand quite well and also observe. Okay, so that's for daily rainfall. Um, and we see that, this is again, sorry for being US centric, but this is um, from our national climate assessment some years, a few years ago. And this shows observations, now historical observations, just to keep us you know, grounded. Um, showing again, percent, percentage increases over different periods of time, which are shown there um, over the, over different, uh, for, for different metrics of precipitation. And let's just focus on the upper right. That's similar to the one we just showed. This was 99.9th um, percent percentile of the distribution of daily rainfall. This is the 99th percentile, so not quite as extreme. We don't really have enough data to do the 99.9th, but, um, and you see big increases, uh, 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 you see increases everywhere in the US, but but the biggest in the Northeast, for reasons I don't completely understand, maybe um, Paul or others um, could explain exactly what's why the Northeast is um, has the biggest increases. But at any rate, the observations are consistent with our theoretical expectations, at least qualitatively, um, and certainly in our region. Um, and this is, I think, a bit less understood, but this is a, um, a, a, a title and abstract in one plot from um, a study by some Dutch researchers, uh, Dutch and English, and um, on hourly rainfall. So I said hourly rainfall was really, really bad, and then I showed you theory for um, for daily. But this research suggests that hourly extremes increase even more strongly with increasing temperature than the daily ones do. And I don't think that we completely understand this. Um, there's some theory about it that is consistent with this, but um, and and as it, and the way they did this was was not um, quite what you'd want to do exactly for the climate problem. It, you you can't ask this question from climate models that hourly scale is just too you don't just don't believe them at that scale. Uh, you have to do something else. But what this really was looking at observational uh, observations, I believe in the Netherlands, um, if I remember correctly, uh, of different precipitation extremes as a function of the temperature it was when they actually happened. And so those temperature fluctuations are mostly not due to climate change, but due to the coming and going of weather. There's a little climate change signal in there, but it suggests that you get much higher hourly rainfalls at warmer temperatures. Um, and these rates of increases, if you, it depends on also on the spatial scale. There's two curves on the right, and it depends on the, on the sort of spatial footprint of the heavy rains. I won't get into details on that, but these curves are, the rate of increase, although you can't necessarily tell quickly by eye, is faster than what I just showed you for daily increases. So there's a suggestion, at least, I think it needs a lot more research, but there's a suggestion that these hourly rainfalls that cause splash flooding are are are, are going to change, increase more rapidly with climate than the daily totals. Um, so some forecasts and warning issues really quickly, because I think these were really fascinating and relevant to why 
the um, damage was so bad. And I, and this is an interdisciplinary group. So I think maybe it'll have some point of contact to some of your interests, maybe. Um, so first of all, uh, why, you know, why, why did this happen? So uh, the mayor at the day after the event, who was getting quite a bit of blame, the, our, now our former mayor, we have a new mayor since a few days ago, um, just because of elections, <laughs> uh, he didn't get ousted or anything. Um, but he said the forecast, you know, were, were wrong. He said, we didn't, we didn't get, you know, this is what he said, the quotes there. This was really not true. And I'll show you that. I think the forecasts were actually quite good. And this was a case of, you know, just wanting to blame somebody, but there was a little bit of truth to it. And I'll try to explain what that little bit of truth was amidst the, 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 the rest of the truth, which is that the forecasts were pretty good. So here's a forecast. Um, this is an actual map issued by the weather service in, you know, in real time. So this was a, a forecast made on the Monday. Remember the heavy rains were Wednesday night into Thursday. And this was a forecast issued on Monday. So this is not post facto. This is, I you know, downloaded this at the time and it showed um, the predicted rainfall, 24 hour rainfall for the period in question, more or less. And you see these very high numbers up in the three, four, five, you know, seven, uh, six inch numbers right over the place where it happened. I where you saw that belt of rain extent. I mean, in case you don't remember, you know, uh, there's the observations. I kind of zoomed in. Remember where the state states are, and there's the forecast. Really, quite astonishingly good, I think, um, both qualitatively and quantitatively. So that's two days before, all right. And then as the event was getting closer, this is a nice graphic from a, a graduate student, actually not here, but another university. I don't know the guy, but he posts beautiful. Name is Tomer Berg, and he posts beautiful stuff on Twitter. Um, and this was, he took different rain, the forecast for that same time, but issued closer and closer to the event. And you can see the forecast getting worse and worse as time gets closer And New York City and Philadelphia are, are shown there. Um, so it was, you know, serious forecast two days before, but then it got more serious as the time got closer. So the mayor surely um, was informed about that. And then, um, but this is, you know, this is from the same guy, Tomer Berg. And I would say actually he's, his stuff is, maybe even better than what our weather services issues in terms of it's like being really, or at least he's among the most savvy, um, you know, I haven't seen anybody post more like useful um, targeted graphics for this event. And he's showing that we expect, you know, rain of four inches, maybe as high as 10 to 14, but he's still talking about a daily total. He's not talking about the hourly numbers. And remember that's what really mattered. Nobody was quite saying that. And so, um, so yeah, so let's come back to that at the end. We've said that the hourly totals are bad. I've shown you and I claim that although the forecasts were accurate, they didn't focus on the hourly number. Nobody was saying, probably nobody was telling the mayor what the hourly totals were going to be or what the consequences of that might be. It so happens that New York City city government had just put together a stormwater resiliency plan that had come out just a few months before about exactly these kind of events. Um, and in that, they had considered a couple of scenarios, the most extreme of which was more or less exactly what happened in Ida. Three and a half inches of rain in an hour. Remember I showed you that's pretty much what it was. They said that's the 100 year storm with a 1% chance of occurrence. You know, we don't have enough data, I think, to say that with precision, but that's a ballpark estimate. Um, not quite accounting for climate change, but you know, okay, pretty, let's take that. Um, and, you know, so, Th that's what they, they modeled this scenario and including hydrological modeling of where the flooding would be. And they said something about what the damage would be. And there was even some policy implications um, talked about one of which was uh, they said the office of emergency management and New York city has an extremely good office of emergency management because we've had nine 11 and Sandy and all these events. And, you know, we have, it's a rich, highly populated city. Oh, one of the statements was OEM should develop sort of policy guidance for how to deal with people in basement apartments but they hadn't yet done that. This was just a plan. And, you know, so nobody really got enough warning to those people in time in the event, which happened again, a couple of months after this report came out. Um, here's just a map. They're showing where the flooding would be. And um, I guess I could have shown you a map of like where the flooding was in Sandy or in, in uh, which was um, in some of these same areas, but, but really quite different because in a coastal flooding event, as in as in uh, river flooding events, generally you get the most flooding in the lowest lying areas. Of course, the water collects 
in the lowest places. But in a flash flood like this, where the rain falls so fast, you get flooding even in elevated places because the water sort of doesn't have time to flow downhill before it goes into subway grates and basement apartments and stuff like that. So this is, anyway, this is just showing you that, I, I don't want to talk about this map in detail, but just to say this was modeled at some level. Um, and just to summarize um, about the forecast and warning. So I think I said this, you know, the, the, the rainfall was um, predicted in terms of daily levels, but maybe not, but the hourly rates weren't emphasized nor the consequences. So it may be that nobody told the mayor there could be three inches, half inches of rain in an hour. And this was what would happen. And you better tell people to get out of their cars and their basement apartments. So I, I'm out of time, but this is my last slide. I just wanted to end with some sort of broader questions that one I think could ask about this event. And some of these are climate science questions and some of these are more policy or engineering or planning questions. But I think one could ask them not just about this event, but many other events, you could ask these same kinds of questions. So what was the probability? Was it a hundred year event or, you know, or something else? That's when you want to think about what's, how much should you plan for it? You want to know if it's something that you expect every two, five, 10, 100, 500 years. Has that probability changed because of global warming? So to what extent is historical data a guide or not? You have to, that's a climate science question. A, a, a practical question for those in government and maybe others, maybe the private sector too, is how much money should be spent to prepare for events that are really unlikely in every given year, but could be really bad if they happen? Um, that's always, you know, a difficult question that depends on the answers to the first two. How can you prepare infrastructure? So this, this is a whole plan about stormwater. A lot of people thinking about that, but this affects, for us, it affects subways, uh, residential buildings, businesses, everything. Um, and again, the big difference here was that we had flooded in places, flooding in different places because a flash flood doesn't have to um, be in the lowest lying areas. And I think a really interesting one is how can we warn people effectively without causing cry wolf syndrome? I mean, if somebody had looked in the models and seen that there could be four inches of rain in an hour and then issued a forecast for that, you know, there's always a chance it wouldn't have happened. The forecast can often be wrong. And then you worry about that the next time um, uh, people won't believe it. And so that's always an issue. So that's all I have. Um, I'm just going to end with a plug for my book and so on. And um, uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I guess it's Q&A.